Hello, I'm Preston Schleinkofer, host of Civil Defense Radio, where we discuss all things civil defense. This is our first opportunity to bring you something a bit different than our usual format of interviews and commentary. This is Civil Defense Radio Presents number one. We're teaming up with the American Leadership and Policy Foundation and their live lecture series. This, uh, this one is number two, Safeguarding the U.S. Constitution in Times of National Crisis. This Civil Defense Radio Presents number one is about the current virus situation and our civil liberties in times of national crisis. Are our rights able to be suspended? Or did the founders of our nation recognize that governments tend to overreach whenever possible and built safeguards into our founding documents that guarantees our rights no matter what happens? This is the essence of our conversation we will have here. We experienced some technical difficulties that required us to reconnect at one point. They returned again, and we terminated the session, but restarted it in a different format. I hope you enjoy this very worthwhile discussion, and at the end, have a better understanding of your rights as the founders envisioned them, and how they should be viewed today within any crisis we may face from here on. The moderator for this discussion was Dr. Sarah J. Nilsson, Associate Professor of Law at Embry-Riddle University and board member of the American Leadership and Policy Foundation. The panelists were Texas Senator from Texas No. 1, Texas First, Brian Hughes, J.D., Lieutenant General Stephen L. Quast, retired, former Commander, Air Education and Training Command, and former President of Air University, Representative Missouri 51st, Dean A. Dorman, President, American Leadership and Policy Foundation. Professor Justin B. Dyer, Director, Kinder Institute for Constitutional Democracy, University of Missouri. Dr. David Stuckenberg, Chairman, American Leadership and Policy Foundation, Military Advisor at U.S. State Department. And David Rowland, Esquire, Director of Litigation and Secretary for the Board, the Freedom Center of Missouri. For more information on the American Leadership and Policy Foundation, please go to their website at www.alpf.org. It is with great pleasure we bring you this episode. Enjoy. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Continuing to take on the toughest questions that citizens have, the American Leadership and Policy Foundation is today hosting its second live lecture with special guests from all around our nation. Policy Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit civic leadership foundation with an emphasis on law, economics, and defense. The American Leadership and Policy Foundation is funded exclusively by citizens and by charter. It does not accept donations from corporations, governments, or individuals. Over 22% of our annual gross funds raised. In short, our commitment is to unbiased research for the people by the people. American Leadership and Policy Foundation is certain we have one constituency, and that's you, the American citizen. Today's discussion will center on the long-term legal, moral, and ethical aspects of COVID-19 response measures and similar historic responses. Discussion will also address how domestic and international crises often work to undermine the U.S. Constitution and just laws in environments where citizens may be distracted, uneasy, or uncertain about the conditions and outcomes of unpredictable events. The goal of this lecture will be to intellectually arm citizens to defend their constitution as America's highest office holders, the citizens. Today's comments will be under the Chatham House rule, which is a system for holding debates and discussion panels on controversial topics. Originating in 1927 at the UK Royal Institute of International Affairs, the premise is that anyone who comes to the meeting is free to use information from the discussion, but is not allowed to reveal who made any comments. It is designed to increase openness of discussion. This means no attribution without the express consent of the panelists. That said, we do live in an age of electronics, so bear in mind your comments are recorded. So before we get going with um, the intros to the um, 
to the panelists. I want to make sure that you can all see my screen. Can I get a thumbs up from someone that they see the screen? I saw a lettered numbered screen come up and it was Charlie one. If that's the screen, then I saw it. Yeah, I don't think the screen is showing. You might want to try sharing again. That was somebody that came online and had their mic open. Okay, I'm going to try that. Give me one brief second. Sorry for that. Um, it's going to need me to read. There you go. It's up now, Cheryl. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to start the session. Um, this is the second um, AL five lecture series, and my name is Sarah. I'm a professional pilot turned aviation attorney, and I practice in the state of Arizona, managing my own solo practice. I also teach aviation and drone law for Embry-Riddle University at the Perskis campus and online. I'm the author and co-author of three legal textbooks, and lastly, I'm a volunteer safety rep for the FAA, doing outreach to pilots and the public. I came to ALPF in 2014 as a senior fellow, and now I also serve on the board of directors. It is my honor to be the moderator on this panel of experts, who I shall now introduce very briefly, as you have the links to their more extensive bios in the meeting invites as well as the chat box, if you are joining via computer. So those panelists and governments, our audience is reminded that their not of local, state, or federal entities. Members are here in a personal and academic capacity city and not a political or government capacity. Finally, I would like to mention that all panelists are here without honorarium. Let's start with the intros and the bios. Texas State Senator Brian Hughes. If you are here, please unmute your mic, say good morning. Brian Hughes is serving his first term in the Texas Senate, representing 15 counties of Senate District 1 in Northeast Texas. Born and raised in East Texas, Senator Hughes promotes individual opportunity and personal liberty so that anyone, everyone can experience the American dream. On behalf of Alpe, I'd like to welcome you to the panel, Senator Hughes. Thank you. Good morning. Glad to be here. Good morning, sir. Our next panelist, Lieutenant General Stephen L. Quast. Prior to his retirement in 2019, Lieutenant Quast was the Commander Air Education and Training Command, Joint Base San Antonio Randolph, Texas. His command included Air Force Recruiting Service, two numbered Air Forces, and Air University. General Quast has served as a military aide to the Vice President. He has more than 3,300 flying hours, including more than 650 combat hours during operations Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Southern Watch, and Allied Force and Enduring Freedom. On behalf of ALPEF, I would like to thank you for your service and welcome you to this panel, Lieutenant Quast. Thank you very much, Sarah, and I'm glad everybody's here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Sarah. Our next panelist, Representative Dean Dormel. In addition to being a senior fellow and president of ALPF, Representative Dormel serves District 51 in Missouri. In addition to his legislative duties, Representative Dormel is an online professor. He is lead faculty of applied social sciences and public management at Colorado State University Global Campus and a public policy expert and author. Dean Dormel has a passion for educating citizens on on responsible civics and the importance of rational discourse. On behalf of ALPF, I would like to welcome you to the panel, Representative Dorman. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Our next panelist, Professor Justin Dyer from the University of Missouri, Department of Political Science, since 2009. We have Professor Justin Dyer, who specializes in American politics. He is the director of the Kinder Institute on Constitutional Democracy. His research is American political development, political philosophy, and constitutional law. Justin is also a prolific author. On behalf of ALPEF, I would like to welcome you to the panel, Professor Dyer. I'm very happy to be here. Our next panelist, Dr. David Stukenberg, founder and chairman of the American Leadership and Policy Foundation and a veteran combat aviator and national security leader. He presently leads global programs and initiatives at the U.S. Department of State and the United Nations. He's also a U.S. Air Force Strategic Policy Fellow. Good morning, sir, and everybody. Thank you for joining. On behalf of ALPF, I would like to welcome you, Dr. Stuckenberg. Our next panelist, Dr. Um, David Rowland, um, Mr. David Rowland, Director of Litigation and Co-Founder 
of the Freedom Center of Missouri. He also serves as the secretary for the Freedom Center's board of directors. Following law school, Dave spent more than three years in the nation's capital as an attorney with the Institute for Justice, where he litigated school choice, economic liberty, and property rights cases in state and federal courts. His work has been discussed in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, Huffington Post, Fox News, and MSNBC, to mention only a few. On behalf of Alpef, I'd like to welcome you to the panel, Dave Rowland. Thanks so, so much for having me. And just to clarify, I don't deserve a doctor title. <laughs> Well, a JD is a doctorate. <laughs> um, our next panelist, Dr. Anne Bradley, hailing from the Institute of World Policy. We have Dr. Anne Bradley, who is a visiting professor of Georgetown University and a visiting scholar at Bernard Center for Women, Politics and Public Policy. Dr. Bradley's academic work focuses on the political economy of terrorism with specific emphasis on the industrial organization of Al-Qaeda. Her academic research has been published in scholarly journals and edited volumes, and has also worked as an economic analyst for the CIA's Office of Terrorism Analysis. On behalf of ALPF, I would like to welcome you to the panel, Dr. Bradley. Good morning, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Welcome. And our final panelist, Dr. Xiaomin Li, hailing from Old Dominion University, Department of Management, professor and em eminent scholar, he specializes in international business, the governance, environment, economic transition, privatization, business strategy, e-commerce, country risk, and health, with a emphasis on China, economic reform, democratization, and foreign investment. He is another prolific author. His articles have appeared in journals such as the Harvard Business Review, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, New York Times, Wall Review. On behalf of Alpha, I would like to welcome you to the panel. Thank you, and uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you, and uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for being here today and giving of your valuable time. So let us begin the week's debate. You have likely seen the news, and for those of you um, who are able to see the chat box, I'll be putting these links in there momentarily. Um, I would like the panel to discuss their comments, their thoughts regarding the breadth of the powers of the various governments with respect to the executive orders in response to COVID-19. And um, I'm gonna put these on, on the chat box. You can take a look at some of the executive orders that have been coming out of pretty much every state country. And here are, I would like to invite any of the panelists to give their thoughts at this point. Sure, I'd be happy to, to jump in with a thought on uh, some of the issues that we're dealing with. One, it brings back the importance of state governments and state constitutions. And so a lot of these orders are happening at the state and local level, and they're happening consistent with, or at least under the authority of state constitutions and state statutes. And so they look different from state to state, but the powers that the states are exercising are, it's part of a traditional police power that states have that are not clearly defined or limited in the same way that the powers of the national government are. And so in some instances, you'll have delegated authority on down from the state constitution to localities and even to the public directors of health in a local community and their executive order then will establish these policies. So I think this is something yeah, so um, I appreciate that comment. This is Steve Quast uh, talking now. And again, if everybody can just mute uh, their devices, even if they're panelists, it'll help everybody hear without the feedback. I uh, appreciate that very much. The, uh, you know, in addition to uh, what we are watching unfold in our nation with regard to states' power versus federal or national power is the fact that all power is derived from the people and, and whatever that derivative is, meaning uh, whether it's uh, you know, a state and then the people rising up against the state overreaching its power. Uh, we're watching this manifest in our lifetime. Uh, this happens in civilizations again and again and again, no matter what their construct for civil society and governance is. Um, and it's really an important time to really uh, remind ourselves of these questions that were the foundation of our nation. Uh, we saw this with the um, 
the flu in uh, 1918 and 1919. Uh, we had two waves of that. The first wave, people voluntarily went to ground like we're doing now and sequestered and uh, quarantined. Uh, but then they got fed up and they went back to work. And the second wave was actually bigger than the first, but they kept working because the damage of economic disaster was greater than the uh, risk of the, uh, the flu. And uh, we saw it again with polio in the 50s. And so this is not new. It's just that in our lifetime as adults, we are watching it manifest. But it's something we need to all look at because it really does start revealing how far we have come as a nation in this insidious uh, reaction of human nature where every time there's a crisis, the population is willing to give up some of their freedoms temporarily to solve the problem of survival. But then we need to take it back. But the government will tend to ratchet the legislation to get more and more power. And so insidiously over the last uh, several hundred years, we have lost power as the people. Our, I think our founding fathers would roll over in their grave if they saw how far we have come. And it's incumbent upon us and why our founding fathers said only a, an educated electorate is going to be able to save the republic. It's incumbent on us to educate one another at the family level and then push off these overreaches of power where they exist. Well said. Anyone else would like to comment on that further from our panelists? I would, I would, if you don't mind. All right, Dean, and I'll go next. All right. Um, I'll speak uh, from my experience at the state level and, and echo a bit of uh, what Dr. Dyer said. Um, our federal system is, is very much geared for this. We're a big, broad country, a lot of territory. We have different, we all live in different areas, obviously a highly urban um, area like New York, uh, a contagious disease like this just sweeps through the population. Where I live, where uh, most of my neighbors are uh, on four legs, um, not as much. And I, I will say, I think uh, from what I've seen, uh, policy-wise, um, I, I have to give credit to the uh, Trump administration for respecting federalism. Uh, in Missouri, I also give uh, good marks to our governor. I think he has not tried to overstep. He's tried to manage this as, as best he can. We have St. Louis and Kansas City, which are very different environments from where I live, of course. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, and, I, and I would encourage this in the future and would like to see more of this, is um, we have had good contact with our congressional delegation. My, uh, my representative where I live, is uh, Vicki Hartzler and then our senior uh, Senator Roy Blunt. Uh, their offices have just been great in, in informing us of what's going through Congress and uh, the details of the program. So uh, that kind of um, communication back and forth, I think, is really critical in the day and age we live in. Thank you. David? Okay, well, th uh, Sarah, first, thanks this morning for hosting um, and for moderating. I know how uh, challenging your job can be, especially uh, uh, having done this a couple weeks ago, and um, the technology is hard. So um, I appreciate everybody's patience um, who's on the line, either calling in or um, on, on their computer um, as we work through the bugs. Um, I've never been on a call without a bug, so um, it just goes with it. It comes with the territory. Um, for those who have helped organize the lecture, uh, just on behalf of the foundation, um, thank you. Special shout out to uh, Ron Jacobus, who uh, is a LA police officer and uh, right now he's out on the beat uh, uh, protecting and serving and he is uh, one of the organizers so ron be safe out there and dylan bryant um, thank you for uh, helping uh, organize this as well um, so just uh, to keep things very simple i just want to make three points because i really want to hear from the panelists and um, there, there's uh, a lot of great things that uh, are to be said this morning but first and foremost i think we need to keep the memory of these constitutional crises and challenges alive um, the anger and the ire we feel uh, when these events happen, I believe, are actually quite positive. Um, it warms the flame of resolve in all of us. And you and I as citizens are the only ones who can say enough is enough. And thankfully, um, because we live in a constitutional republic, our government has to listen. So each generation's memory is, uh, uh, I think, requiring kind of a refreshing of um, the understanding, the of the fragility um, of our constitution and this journey that we're on, this grand experiment. Um, there hasn't been a civilization in history 
until now that has discovered how to balance just laws, uh, personal liberty, private ownership, and our God-given human rights, inalienable human rights. Um, to that, you know, these are things that empower us all. And so uh, we have together uh, taken a great stride forward in history. And in less than 300 years, most civilizations that have embraced democracy have advanced. Um, and uh, some would even venture to say that um, the uh, United States has taken a leap as much as 5,000 years. Um, but when we lose sight of history, tyranny lies at the door. So let's hope that the events and trespasses that the American people have experienced during this generation will be uh, the only wake up call we need. And let's hope another's not needed in our lifetime. My second point is that when we are passive, we allow our freedoms to be drawn down, whether it's constitutional or other, otherwise. But the main benefactor of that is our adversaries. And while there may be momentum gained in whatever area, whether it's uh, safety, prosperity, expediency, maybe even better intelligence gathering, such as in the uh, uh, case of uh, the uh, Patriot Act, uh, whatever the reason or justification, if we slide toward ideologies like socialism, which is an adolescent form of communism, then the roots of this evil can grow deeper and deeper. So we must not give these roots and beliefs room to grow uh, because they destroy the fabric of our society. And if you disagree with this, then let's take note of, of the criticality of the expansion of uh, undermining efforts such as Confucius centers and fake news propagated by um, you know, the great power competition and our near peers and peers. The goal of these is to cause you and I to go to battle with each other because a house divided cannot stand. And um, that's more than just a cool slogan. It's ancient truth, and it's truth as old as time itself. So whatever the debate is, um, you know, we always need to come back to the common ground uh, to us as Americans. And then the final point I'll make is uh, this visual analogy to uh, not to General Quast and what he mentioned earlier, that, you know, if our civilization is a democratic civilization, um, it is unique because of the U.S. Constitution, right? Uh, this is the instrument holding back fear and hunger, that same fear and hunger that has plagued mankind uh, for eons. Those in the Department of Defense work to support and defend the Constitution because this is the delineating factor. If this instrument can be thought of as a long leash, at the end of that leash, there's a mad dog, and that mad dog is tyranny and oppression. Crises of fear and danger send that dog to the end of the leash, and um, each time that dog hits the end, the tether of freedom and liberty is pulled bit by bit, often imperceptibly, just a little bit more. And remember, our constitutional powers as citizens provided in the Bill of Rights, the vehicle of constitutional conventions through the election of just and fair representatives and judges and the like. These are the means by which we, the people, push the tether of uh, freedom back into the ground each generation. And each generation that comes after us is counting on us, and you've heard me say it many times before, to water the tree of liberty rather than stand by and watch it wither. So we must be engaged. We will be judged by our actions in this generation. And I wanna applaud all that have joined the lecture today, and especially our panelists, because your participation is evidence of your action, your dedication to freedom. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, David, for your comments. I'd like to jump in if I could. Um, so I come at this issue from the standpoint of a constitutional litigator, and um, I have been peppered with all kinds of questions over the last six weeks with um, citizens saying, what can we do? Can the government really do this? And so um, I'd like to, to share with the other panelists and also with the, the listeners kind of the assessment that we constitutional litigators have been making over the last six weeks. Um, and what I have to start with whenever I talk to people about this is kind of what our history is when it comes to dealing with epidemics. Um, going back even into the, the English legal history before the founding of the Republic, um, government took upon itself a lot of powers when there was an epidemic going around. And, and in particular, um, the power of quarantine and then uh, the power of cordon. And so we need to distinguish those two concepts. Quarantine applied when there was somebody who might be suspected of carrying a contagious disease, and the, the government would assume to itself the authority to tell them, you've got to isolate away from the rest of society for a particular period of time. Um, so that's the concept of quarantine. 
The second concept is cordon, and that is when there was a contagious disease that was thought to be present in a particular area, uh, they would essentially try and wall off that area to prevent the disease from getting into other parts of a city or other parts of a country. Um, so th those are the powers that were historically used uh, in times of epidemic. And I, I try to make a distinction um, when I'm talking to people about philosophy, uh, which we all, I, I believe, on, on this call and in this conference have a, a philosophy of, of liberty. Um, but then there's also the question of how the Constitution has been interpreted. And, and this is where, as a constitutional litigator, it gets a lot more challenging uh, because even from the early days of the Republic, uh, our, our state and federal constitutions have been interpreted in such a way that they have, that courts have upheld the power of quarantine and cordon in times of epidemic. So unfortunately, when we're dealing with the courts, precedent is a huge, huge deal. And, and courts are uh, predisposed to follow the path that's been laid out in front of them, even if the powers being exercised in the present day are significantly more extensive than the powers have been used previously. So um, there are litigators like me all over the country that are working on strategies for how do we try and rein in um, the abuses of power that we've seen manifest over the last several weeks, um, while also um, persuading courts that they actually have the authority to to impose those reins on the government. Um, and, and so essentially what I've told people is we have to focus on the distinctions between the historical uses of these powers and what's been happening over the last few weeks. So um, when we come to these lockdown orders where cities would lock down an entire city, states would lock down an entire state, that really is much more extensive than quarantine and cordon have ever been used before because the idea of quarantine and cordon all hinged on the idea that a particular person or a fairly identified and limited area were being affected uh, by a contagious disease. Well, so here in Missouri, um, yes, the major cities were being hard hit uh, by, by the disease, um, some of the smaller cities to a significantly lesser extent, but there were a lot of rural areas where there were zero cases. Uh, there, I believe, are still several counties in Missouri that have zero cases, and yet um, under the statewide uh, stay-home order that was put out, people were basically being told, you're running the risk of criminal prosecution if you continue to go about your life the way that you al always have. Um, so I believe that, that that kind of extension of the power is unwarranted. Uh, and it is my hope that courts would eventually step in and say, no, look, it's one thing to tell people who have been diagnosed with a disease or, or have been in close contact with someone who has been diagnosed with a disease. You can tell them that they have to isolate and the Constitution will permit that. If you can identify a limited area where the disease is particularly bad, you can block off that area, but you can't tell people who have never been diagnosed with a disease and have not been in close contact with uh, someone with the disease that their liberty can be restricted. That is you know, a bridge too far, so to speak, even assuming that the government has the general powers that they've been exercising uh, in the course of epidemics. Uh, so we have been looking for ways to kind of chip at the edges of governmental power. I've, I've told people who have called me about potential cases, um, we, can't, we can't swing for the fences with these cases. That's been tried recently in Pennsylvania and Michigan, where people challenged the general authority of the government to impose stay-home orders. Um, that's, that's what I call swinging for the fences, trying to hit a home run. Those have been completely unsuccessful, and in fact, it's reinforced bad law. Um, so what I've been encouraging people to do is aim for singles and doubles. Um, courts have been willing to strike down cordon orders where they have been applied unequally. So there was a case back in California uh, at the early 20th century where uh, there was a disease going through Chinatown in San Francisco, and they cordoned the area of Chinatown, but 
only for people of Asian descent. So people who were not of Asian descent were allowed to come and go in and out of Chinatown, but only uh, basically the Chinese were being affected by the cordon order. The courts struck that down and said it's unconstitutional. If you want to put up a cordon, that's fine, but it has to apply evenly to everybody. You can't pick and choose uh, who gets to cross that line. Uh, and there have been other examples. That's just the most famous, but there have been other examples of um, courts reining in the powers here under specific circumstances. So as the people listening to this are considering what can they do, um, if you consider the possibility of a lawsuit, there are uh, almost certainly an organization like mine, uh, my, mine is the Freedom Center of Missouri, but every state uh, but a few has an organization that is similar, that is, is focused on constitutional litigation, get in contact with them and uh, see if they're interested in bringing some cases that would challenge this. Because I think in the short term, uh, legal challenges are probably our most effective avenue to try and uh, rein in the power that's being exercised. The legislative process takes a long time. Uh, the executive process, all you can do is vote out whoever the executive is. Some, some executives are gonna be on the ballot in November, others will not. Um, but but I think that the courts are hopefully um, a prime avenue to to start reigning in that power in the near term. And I'll close my comments now, and I'll, I'll look forward for opportunities to weigh in as the the conversation proceeds. Thank you very much, Dave. And for those uh, participants listening in, um, if you have questions throughout um, these these comments, please use the chat box. And um, so as not to interrupt the participant, the uh, panelists, but um, would anyone else on the panel like to add in further comments? Hi, Sarah, this is Ann Bradley. May I make a few comments? Absolutely, Ann, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, so there's a few things, I'm an economist, and of course, uh, you know, I think economists have been not silent, but certainly not at the policy making table here like they should be. Of course, that might be my bias. But the problem with um, this broader conversation is not only um, what is the right thing to do in terms of state, federal, and local power, but what is the cost of doing it? So kind of the question that we have to continue to wrestle with is at what cost are we willing to engage uh, in lockdowns, um, how long do they last? So you have to fully count the costs, not just partially count the costs. So I, you all have been following the news, you probably know some of the numbers, uh, but GDP is down 4.8%. Um, and that's really in a quarter of a quarter because in February, this was early February, this was not the case. And for the past three years, GDP has grown annually at about 2.5% a year. Um, and that's you know what you would expect from the American economy. And so just to have this drastic decrease, and it's mostly driven about 60% of that decline is driven by a decrease in consumer spending. Of course, this the, the associated problem with that is that people are unable to work. And so I think that's what we have to figure out is how do you reconcile um, legitimate public safety concerns with the economic costs. And of course, keep in mind that the economy is made up of people. So when we say we wanna save lives by engaging in protective orders, uh, and the cost of that is shutting down the economy, that also uh, results in poverty, um, increased suffering, suicide rates are on the rise. And so we really need to fully incorporate the costs of these actions. And also I think we need to understand the political motivations around what's going on. So. Uh, General Quas talked about this in his opening comments, which is that um, in times of crisis, these are the most convenient times for people who are in positions of power to expand their scope of powers. This is not new. Um, it's, you know, as old as time, but I think we need to be very uh, studious, aware, um, and raise, you know, our voices around this. Uh, you, you posted an article about Virginia and our governor, I live in Virginia, and I can tell you that one thing that's very interesting about his order is that uh, when he originally uh, declared the lockdown, he, he suggested that it would go till June 11th. Originally, the primary elections were supposed to be June 9th, and of course, he postponed those till after the lockdown. So there are some kind of 
political shenanigans that are always at work. And I think we need to be aware of those and really looking at all the factors here. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we're fully doing that. And I think that's going to exacerbate and prolong the economic uh, and human costs of this. So the human costs can't only be counted in lives lost to the disease, which of course is tragic, needs to be taken care of, and we need to address it. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that the government is the only institution of society that is able to be put into action here. So I think we're seeing some other positive things that are going on, and I'm happy to talk about those later. Um, but I think we need to fully incorporate the cost benefit analysis here. And I'm not sure uh, when you listen to the news, you're getting that full picture. Thank you, Anne. That was uh, very good. Um, anyone else on the panel would like uh, Xiaomin? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to uh, make some. Uh, I enjoyed uh, your your uh, comments, but uh, I have some different perspective. You know, one is um, when we talk about uh, the power, let's say, power struggle between the fed, federal government and the state. Uh, that's may not be the issue that we're facing, and that's the power is the way of uh, uh, governing. But then we have the capacity of governing. So it's a, the, the first one is, uh, we can call it a gene type because when we talk about power, say, oh, you know, China is more efficient in dealing with this. Therefore, uh, you know, authoritarianism is better than democracy. We, we have heard that. So that's a misleading statement. Here in this country, we should talk about state capacity. When they say state, state capacity, I don't mean the 50 states, I mean government. What is government capacity? It's a governing ability, uh, political rights, uh, trust, uh, culture, which is very important, uh, information, free flow of information, and uh, the effectiveness of regulation and the law. It's not the federal government versus uh, the state government. We are facing a crisis that is originated from a communist state. It's outside of our jurisdiction. So when we talk about, you know, the, the lawsuit of, uh, you, you know, in this country, I am saying, gee, I mean, the Communist Party leaders were laughing as of, they say, they're, they're already having this. Why, why don't we, you know, uh, draw our attention to the solution of this virus? The virus is only agent. It's not really <laughs> our enemy. I mean, the, the real original host of this virus is a Chinese Communist Party. That is uh, our real enemy. Is this our enemy? Uh, actually, it's not. It's our partner. So it's not like uh, we're in the hot war with the Communist Party. We're not even in the cold war. You know, our you know, uh, biggest, largest firms are in China. And that their largest firms are in this country. We depend on each other. How do you fight this enemy? And I think that is, uh, so we have to put it into a global perspective uh, to, to think about this. I give you a, you know, in this global, uh, so I don't call it a war, but global competition, the competition between two, two sets of institutions, communism in China, it's not real communism politically, it's a communism economically, it's a state-led uh, capitalism. Actually, the Chinese Communist Party runs the whole country like a corporation, which I call it like a China Inc. When our federal state deals with the Chinese state, actually you're dealing with a gigantic corporation which can act very swiftly with a, all the resource in the country as their employees and the, and the units. When the, when the US firm is dealing with the Chinese firm, you're not dealing with a firm, you're dealing with a unit of China Inc with unlimited resource, with state capacity. So we, you know, in this, I don't think our founding fathers have you know, ha had this kind of example when they, when they framed our constitution. You know, in the, we, we're, we're very capable of dealing with the real visible enemy, as uh, the panel has said in the past, how do we deal with even the world wars? But how can we deal with an invisible enemy? Well, the virus 
give people a, a misconception we let's fight the virus but behind the virus the host is a, a party that can mobilize the whole country now i like the economic analysis that i, I calculated the whole uh, the, the chinese economy based on purchasing power is about 20 trillion and our economy is about 19 trillion so chinese economy is slightly bigger but given the the increase rate they will be much bigger and uh, for that GDP of 20 trillion, the Communist Party directly controls 56%. Okay, our federal government controls about 33 to 36%. Uh, percent. But in our, as we know here, we have checks and balance, and the 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 the, uh, the largest percentage of that uh, 36 is in social service, welfare, and social security. And there are 56% in the Communist Party's hand. The number one uh, expenditure is internal maintenance, internal stability. The police, the informers, the big data surveillance, the cameras. And second, only second is military. And then foreign aid. Most of the foreign aid or foreign spend, expenditure is in Washington. They, they have this part, a strategy of influencing the influencers. They, they pretty much bought all the men tanks, uh, per, you know, uh, universities or uh, government uh, officials through uh, money, through uh, internet surveillance, and actually you know, through uh, uh, sexual service. They have the three weapons that were very effective. And we really have, you know, in our democracy, open society, we, I don't know, we, we cannot really effectively stop it. And is this asymmetrical? No, I give you an example. Uh, VOA, I'm, a, I'm on the pen, uh, no, Voice of America. That's the government, uh, US government uh, official uh, news outlet. Okay. VOA is infiltrated by the Chinese Communist Party in the following ways. I don't want to name names, but a very high official of VOA, this person's family has billions of business in China, okay? And uh, uh, I talked to the, the, the Chinese section a lot, the Chinese language section of VOA. Many of their employees, their families back in China are harassed, uh, also uh, you know, kind of bribed. You either you know, take their money or you go to jail or you, you, you lose your job. So they're there and they have, <laughs> Uh, people in the, there there's some evidence they have uh, uh, agents and, uh, also working in uh, VOA but that's a, that's a, like a behind the scenes but but openly VOA the coverage of China uh, has a policy called the balance report so if you have one uh, a news item that is negative on China you have to balance it with a positive report on China think about this is the Chinese Communist Party's uh, people's daily, China daily, are they balanced? No, the U US voice in China has 0% uh, market. Has, the, the, you have no voice in China and the 100% Chinese media uh, reporting on China is also positive when they report on the US is negative. So in China, we have zero influence. And here, not only they are freely, uh, promoting, propagating their views uh, here, but also our own media, our own official media has to balance. So this is a kind of a, a intrinsic handicap of our system in fighting this new, this new virus from China. Now, this is very different from the old days of Soviet Union because Soviet Union, their corrupt officials don't have big houses here. They don't have forms here, and we don't have forms there. So it's very easy to kind of fight the Cold War because we don't really do business with that can. But now, how can we fight this new war? That I think that is a question I will uh, pose to the to the panel and the audience. Thank so, you for those comments, Xiaoming. Um We had a question from Michael while you were speaking that came through the chat box and I love how well coordinated this is going. Uh, Michael, would you like to ask your question to the panel? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, 
So, Doctor, I appreciate those comments. Um, one of the things that that brought up is something I had been thinking about, and that was our lack of self-reliance, right? And what's our path to a more self-reliant posture as individuals and as a government? Uh, you brought up kind of the how this is kind of a global thing, and we rely on other countries and trade and everything for um, you know the you know economy. Well, how do we have a more self-reliant posture? Um, at, at kind of all levels, not just individually and at the federal level, but uh, you know, kind of at, at at all levels. And I like the panel's thoughts on that. Yeah, Sarah. So you mind if I uh, take that one? And I'll be very brief, so the other panelists can uh, chime in on this. But this is why this is such a rich learning environment, because we are watching uh, something play out that has many different layers to it, from the economic layer to the political to the cultural to the ideological. And uh, it, I, I would suggest that if, if you, you would read the Federalist Papers again in the context of what we're doing now, that our founding fathers did anticipate this. And this is why the purpose of the federal is to gather together enough effort to be able to defend ourselves for our survival. But that's the end of it, meaning that it's only to survive and no more. And that the uh, precedence that we talked about legally is only precedence, and it only becomes law if we let it become law as a society. Um, and that with regard to China, China is playing the age old book of competition where they start with information, because if they can control your perception of truth and your perception of reality, then they control everything after that. And they, we, we whittle into the economy because all national security is economic power. Um, and so there are so many things we can learn from this. Uh, and uh, this get, kind of gets back to, to the question at hand as well. And that is that we, uh, we as a society need to remind ourselves of these principles of how we survive when the crisis is urgent. And then don't let the government ratchet the legal system, the legislation to galvanize that power required to survive. But we ratchet it back through the courts and through the other mechanisms, through our elections and our votes, uh, to make sure that we keep that freedom over time, even if it's an adversary as clever and as insidious as China. But there's nothing new in that playbook. It's just that we are not used to a world so interconnected and so fast. Thank you for those comments. Anyone else would like from the panel to uh, respond to that? I'd love to. Um, I probably have a, maybe an unpopular opinion here, but I actually don't think full self-reliance is the answer. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't mitigate the way that we engage in global trade, but I don't think, I, and I'm worried, I'm actually worried about um, what trade agreements and what trade relationships are going to look like in a time after COVID, uh, because I do think that we we're already there, right? The toothpaste is out of the bottle in terms of the type of global interconnected world that we live in. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm worried about the, the policy calls to return. And I'm not suggesting that this is what you're saying, but I think some people are gonna be calling for much greater levels of protectionism. Um, and, and mercantilism is going to become popular. It was already almost there, but I think this will certainly push it over the edge. And here's the reason why I think that's a problem. Uh, there, there's a couple of reasons. One, I don't think you can undo the world we live in. Um, and of course, a pandemic, a crisis like this, this is not the last one we're going to see. And so the question is, does you know self-reliance insulate us from a crisis? Um, maybe, but again, the question that I have as an economist is at what cost does it do that? And so if we, you know, if we're talking about the production of goods and services and you know the calls for um, greater production at home follow the COVID crisis, which I think they will from some circles, I think that that's gonna raise the price of consumer goods. I think that's going to further improv impoverish people at the bottom of the income distribution who cannot withstand those price increases. I think it makes us less competitive because it requires that we do more on our own. And so really one of the most fundamental lessons in economics is that, uh, Mutually, mutually voluntary trade makes us all better off. And so the China question, and it's not just China, it's Russia, it's other places, right? But the questions that we have with countries who don't wanna play 
by the rules, right? Who don't want to respect the rule of law and the rule of markets and all these things, as Dr. Lee talked about. We're not dealing um, uh, with a country that has a lot of credibility. Uh, but what I will say is that we're dealing with a China that's very different than it was 40 years ago. So I do think that there's hope for optimism in the future, maybe not tomorrow, but in the long run, we are all going to be better off if countries like China and Russia become countries that are rich in economic freedom. Because when they become rich in economic freedom, political freedom follows. There's a lot of empirical and theoretical work that has been done on this. And so if we want China to not be basically, you know, kind of state-sponsored capitalism that's very heavy-handed in its authoritarianism, I actually think global trade and the pursuance of that, although under different circumstances going forward, is going to help us get to that solution rather than retreating totally inward. Now, I say that. That doesn't mean that we need to be, we don't need to be better prepared in, in, for events like this in the future. Because like I said, I don't think this is not the last time this is going to happen. And so how do you have etern internal preparedness um, when you don't know what's coming? These are, of course, very difficult things to do. But I think that's what I would like to see a lot more emphasis put on rather than a return to more kind of isolationism in terms of our economic policy. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to wait. May I make a comment? Oh, okay, just uh, just one second. This is David, um, and then uh, Doc, Dr. Lyle, let you. Um, you know, there was a a philosopher named William James. Probably many of you have heard of him. Um, he he uh, uh, is renowned. He was a Harvard uh, professor back in the early 1900s. But he was um, very much a proponent proponent of something um, better known as pragmatism, right? And so um, he he one day. Uh, gave an example to the people, uh, some colleagues he went camping with of a, uh, a scenario that he encountered after he'd kind of gone up into the hills on a hike. He came back to the camp and his philosophy friends were in, split into two camps arguing whether or not a man can get around a squirrel who uh, the squirrel is on the tree and can the man practically get around it. Some of you probably heard this before, but the point is um, the, 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 the two uh, groups were you know, very, very much split as to whether or not the man could get around the squirrel. And he said, well, it really just matters what you practically mean by going around the squirrel. Um, the definition is, is very important and most importantly is the outcome. So can, can a guy ever go around the squirrel without the squirrel countering his moves and going around the tree? Probably not, but can he go to the north, to the south, to the east and the west and form a square box around the tree and go around the squirrel? Then yes. So it depends on what your definition is. And so what he meant by that is to drive down to the real uh, point of the argument. And, and he said, actually, um, whenever a dispute arises, we ought to be able to show some practical difference that must follow from one thing or the other being right. And so um, in terms of Anne's uh, very intelligently uh, you know, articulated comments, I would say, well, what is the practical outcome of one or the other being right? And so what we have tried now in terms of foreign policy, and uh, then I'm going to yield to Dr. Lai, but, uh, you know, we have tried this, hey, you know, let's hope that moderation comes with the Chinese Communist Party, um, and in turn, that uh, they will liberalize. And so um, I think uh, many proponents of that um, have acknowledged that it's a, failed, um, it's a failed philosophy, a failed experiment, and that is not the aim of the Chinese Communist Party so long as it remains in power. And uh, so we have to say, okay, well, so what then, right? What is the practical outcome of that in terms of not looking at this ne necessarily from a legal standpoint, but from a pragmatic standpoint? And the practical outcome is what is the ultimate aim of China here? What is the ultimate aim of the Communist Party? And that is very much to supplant the Western Westphalian system. And um, for those, uh, I'll remind us that the Westphalian system came into play a long, long time ago, early in the 1600s. This was about how to, uh, you know, morally recognize international boundaries, uh, chivalry, uh, laws, sovereigns, and those things are being set aside when convenient or adhered to when it serves the, you know, the, the strategy. And so what uh, Dr. Light described is a gray zone strategy where we're dipping in and out of law when it suits, um, you know, the party. And so what we have really here is, is, a, is a bad and a moral actor. And we've seen um, the, the repercussions of this now circulate worldwide. 
Um, and so what I would uh, again point out is that um, we, we have to kind of go to a new model realizing that China really does have an aim here. Um, this is not a just a simply a competitive strategy where um, you know we're trying to put one boat in front of the other or build one economy over the other. And um, you know perhaps uh, General Quas could describe for us a little uh, more because he is an expert in uh, uh, Chinese asymmetric strategy. Uh, you know, and, and he, especially with respect to space, can describe to you um, the aims of China. But I'll just point out that they have not missed a benchmark for anything they've set out to do since 1981. And uh, so for the better part of almost 40 years, they always deliver on what they say and what they have in store um, is something we need to pay attention to. Thank you, David. Um, Xiaomin, go ahead, yeah. please. And then, um... Okay. Thank you, thank you. I, I really enjoy your your comments. Let me uh, make some comments. First of all, uh, to uh, Dr. Bradley, I, I don't think we're going back to protectionism. American economy, let's just think about those facts. We have the lowest uh, tariff, lowest import tax. Our society is open. You know, a firm, uh, the CEO can openly criticize our president and the president can do nothing to stop this firm here legally. So we are an open economy, but that is precisely why the Chinese is taking the advantage of it. So we're, we can trade with others. So that's one comment. And second one is, I think uh, I call uh, 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 Mr. Stanberg and your point, they, we, we all hoped that, was, that, was, that is called the engagement school. The engagement school said, in the, when when uh, the world admitted China into the WTO said, well, we hope, as we have seen in England back a few hundred years ago, uh, when we trade, there will be uh, the, the common people will become you know, rich, become you know, well-to-do, there will be a you know, middle class. The, the most famous quotation from Barrington Moore uh, is uh, no bourgeoisie, no democracy. So bourgeoisie, the middle class, the foundation of democracy. And uh, uh, the former president Clinton at his famous speech that, you know, if we let China uh, trade, then there will be a middle class. They will demand uh, liberty, freedom, and democracy. But that, doesn't, that has not happened. That, that does not happen. Why? I, I studied this and I look at just based on my own experience. My, you know, my wife is from a sibling of four. I from sibling of four. Our six siblings in China, they are well-to-do. Well they are middle class, they buy cars, houses, but none of them, none of them made their status independent of the state. Everybody is living under the permission, the, the, the blessing of the state. If one criticism they made, they lose everything. Interestingly, in the past 20 years, we hoped that with market, the, the government will, will retreat from the market, but the government and the, the, the officials, they taste this opium. The opium is power. They control every industry in China. So my colleague, uh, Dr. Jie Chen, he wrote a famous book. The title says, A Middle Class Without Democracy. How can, no, the, the, uh, back in the England, when the, when the merchant class, middle class fight against the king because they made their fortune independent of the king. So they can, they can say, okay, king, you, can, you have to be under the law. If the king gives me my job, gives my title, my property, can I say that? No, that is what happened in China. No one. And, the, and I, one economist, Dr. Zhang Weiying, the, a very uh, leading economist in China, he said he found only one industry that the party has the least control. Domestic service maid. You can hire a, a maid from the street working in your home. Only that industry, the government has very little control. So pathetic. Okay. So here goes the, 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 the trade will have a middle class. The middle class will, to, uh, will uh, demand democracy to protect themselves. That does not work in China. Okay. And, uh, uh, Secondly, look at China's uh, industrial policy. China's industrial policy is like this. They identify the, well, when I say China, I mean the Communist Party, I don't mean Chinese people. Uh, the, 
they identify a number of key industries. See, okay, this year we're going to sponsor one. One industry, we mobilize the whole society's resource to develop this industry, close the border, no, no foreign country, uh, competition, and they have huge markets so they can quickly uh, you know, achieve the uh, economy of scale, make this, this one form or couple forms very, very efficient, very low cost, and then open the, uh, the, border, uh, the border, go out, conquer the whole world in this industry, become the dominant player. No, uh, electric car, battery, just to name a few, a solar panel, high speed rail. They learn from foreign uh, leaders, get their technology and develop in China. First, try it in the domestic market, huge, protected. And when it works, go out one by one. They can actually, I, I, I will not be surprised if they do this, uh, like in the next 10 years, they will dominate all the key industries in the world. Okay, so think about this game. We want to play, a, a, let's say global trade is a game. Let's say it's a two country game, China versus US. China will say, okay, let's play the game. Okay, uh, by the way, I already bribed the, the judge. So the WTO, the WHO, they're already in my pocket. Uh, by the way, my coach is also the player. The player is also the judge. And so. And also, uh, by the way, my, my players are taking steroids. So let's play. The US being a democracy, you know, transparency, checks and balance, we cannot bribe the judge, we cannot take drugs. So what is the outcome of this, this game? It's pretty obvious. If you keep playing, you will lose. So you will leave China, uh -huh. no, Pro protectionism, anti-globalization. So what do we do with this? I think the near term, the only solution, the most effective solution is probably dealing. Well, I'm not saying we are isolate ourselves. We're dealing from China. Let's have a two camp world. One camp led by the US, democracy, rule of law, you no know, reciprocity, you no know, zero tariff. The other camp, China, I don't know who followed that, that camp, maybe Africa. Maybe some uh, uh, small countries that you know, depend on China's aid and everything, we can do their game. For us, the pr product, uh, the price of product will rise in the in the near term because we lose in a, a cheap uh, supplier. But but now the world has more than seventy billion people. The two camp, our camp, is big enough to have all the benefit of our globalization, comparative advantage economy of scale, we can do that in the long, long term. And we, we don't have to have the daily confrontation with China in terms of tech and, and, uh, ideology, everything. Let's have a peaceful uh, competition. And uh, what would happen in China's camp? If China still uh, uh, practices a predatory industrial policy and uh, everything, and then the taking steroids, bribing the judge, that camp, all the people in that camp will, will fight up, say, okay, I'm going to be linked with you. So eventually the game will come back, China will be isolated. But the question is, can a dictatorship be isolated? My answer is no, here's why. If a dictatorship is, is isolated, if it's a closed regime, there'll be a lot of infight because they don't have an open, open uh, uh, system that can take resource from trade because they, they, they practice unfair trade to, come, uh, to, to, to take it back. And the party takes the, the lion's share, all the people take a little bit and they still, you know, there's a trickle down, they still can be better off. If you cut it uh, off, there'll be infight because the party will take uh, at absolute loss, uh, loss of the people. But that's not uh, the, the only problem. The second problem, that kind of a predatory system the parties, the party officials and their cronies, they love the lawlessness of China because they can loot, but they fear their own lawlessness because if they lose a power struggle, they will be in jail, their assets will be all gone. So they have their families in this country, in the country of law, they have their assets here. So they need a, a open system 
to uh, funnel to to just uh, transfer their their family and the assets to democracies to be safe to be safe and also keep looting in their own system and keep looting the world through trade so if, if we run this game uh, multiple stage we will see that dealing the two camp system i i actually believe democracy rule of law will, will prevail and their system will eventually degenerate into isolation of the this uh, huge regime the, the chinese communist party so that probably will force them to democratize that's the only solution thank you thank you Sean. I appreciate that. My way in here. general quest and um then um we'll, we'll go next and then your comments thanks yeah I'm, i'll be very brief because again there's a lot of wisdom that needs to be expressed here in this uh, grouping so but uh, this kind of ties back to uh, Mike's question. Uh, and so, Doctor, I think you've done a good job of describing China's mindset, China's uh, strategy, and, uh, and the vulnerability over time. But for us, as we're thinking about this coronavirus and our constitution, uh, I want to bring us back to kind of the longer view, because China is going to only be one of many competitors that will try to um, dominate economic prowess globally against America, and it comes down to the economy. Um, and this question of how do we become more resilient? How do we have more independence there? And I think uh, technology does change economics to a certain degree. We, we uh, the, the point was made about the fact that we need to um, have these uh, distribution systems that are global is absolutely true. What I would propose is one of the balances here is um, to allow America to benefit from the blessing of diverse products and ideas from all over the world where every civilization is created equal. Uh, myself being raised in an African tribe, I have a, a deep abiding sense of the value of each culture. And uh, we don't want a bipolar world of just China and US, we want a multipolar world of all these blessings. But this is about what can America learn to endure uh, the future technologies and disruptions that will impact our economy. And I think we have a lot of work to do to get to Mike's question on what, what can we do to have local independence and resilience of the seven pillars of prosperity for people locally to have jobs. And that's the food and water, shelter, transportation, information, you know, the manufacturing and the healthcare care uh, that you need locally. That you can have a balance where if everything were cut off for some reason, whatever the threat, you can survive and people can work and have dignity and prosperity, even though it might not be global prosperity, and that when there is no threat, you benefit from that global prosperity. We have not done that to date as an American society. We have gone the expedient way where if it's cheaper to have it built in China, we had it built in China, and that chicken's coming back to roost because of what the doctor pointed out, the character and the strategy of China. Thank you, Lieutenant General Quest. Um, did you want to go ahead, Dean? <clears throat> yes, if I might. Uh, just quickly on the uh, the international topic in the uh, the economic sphere of all of this, um, I think we all I think we all believe in the market here, at least uh, those of us on the panel. And the only way for free markets to work or, or the, to be fair markets, I think that's uh, where Dr. Lee is is with this. And what and you know it is a challenge. What what, what are we going to do with uh, someone who's moved in and has changed the rules of the game on us. Uh, we constructed uh, what is now the World Trade Organization after World War II, um, based a lot on theory. We're getting some practice. And what are we going to do about that in the future, I think, is uh, one of the questions we'll have to answer in public policy. And uh, that leads me into a couple more questions. I think uh, because this is so unique and something we've not encountered before, we've got a lot of questions in public policy. Um, Number one, I think in uh, the constitutional question is, how much authority does the government have to deny assembly for profit, for production, for exchange? That's what an economy is about. Um, and, and, you know, in this age of uh, sort of uh, always the um, temptation of state capitalism, um, you know, where's that line? Where, where, where are we going to uh, work between uh, standing up to China and enjoying all the benefits of individualism and freedom that we have known in uh, the United States. And that brings us into, um, you know, specifically Missouri. Um, you know, this is the heartland. This is where we raise food. 
Uh, we have Chinese who have um, investments here. Um, now they can't pick those investments up and take them back, but they certainly affect us, right? We had the uh, the uh, swine herd incident in China. Fortunately, uh, that did not get into the United States, but um, in these operations that we have today in agriculture, you know, swiftly uh, things can move through our herd. Not only people are affected, so also our food supply, which is uh, obviously critical. Um, what do we do about that? The Chinese uh, Communist Party, the CCP, is really, uh, they are on all fronts. And uh, to, to, to go back to Dr. Lee and culture, they understand our culture, I think, very well. I've, I've sat with them in meetings, um, some of their CCP representatives. They, they understand us very well, and they know um, the key words um, that, that really light us up and, and we enjoy hearing. Um, and, and I'm not, not certain that we so much uh, understand where they're coming from. And I think that's something we're going to have to uh, start taking into consideration in the in the future, it's a, you know, what what is going to be our relationship? Missouri is more tied to Taiwan than it is to mainland China, uh, but we see what's happening. Um, look what's going on in Hong Kong right now. You know, multiple arrests of those who are are, are on the uh, freedom front. Uh, again, uh, pushing the uh, Chinese Navy pushing in the South uh, China Sea. So um, all of these things are. are or top to bottom for us, uh, you know, from the international, the national to the state level. These are things we've got to talk about. And I'm, and I'm very glad for this forum. It's, it's uh, you know, a lot of great ideas, but these questions are the questions and many more that we're gonna to have to answer going forward, considering how small the globe has become. Thanks, Dean. And, and on the note of questions, um, I also wanna see if Texas Senator Hughes is on the line here. We haven't heard from him. I'm not sure if you are on. If you are, go ahead and unmute. Um, we have a question came in from, from a member of the audience, from the participants, and I'm going to read it, and I'm going to invite anyone on the panel to answer this. I would be interested to see how the panel feels about the intel reports that the virus emanated from the Wuhan lab and Chaikon's efforts to propagate a false narrative as to their responsibility for not warning the world sooner, that is blaming the US. Would anyone like to answer that participant's question? Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll just make a quick comment on this. Um, it, it is fascinating to me um, to see this play out uh, because um, China is using information warfare as the uh, entree to economic warfare. And if this had happened 10 years from now, where five, if China was able to get their global 5G uh, network that included the space layer and the quantum and the AI uh, that would be part of that, the entire world would believe that uh, the American military planted this virus in China and that it's our fault. And we would not be able to respond because 5G manipulation in even in American 5G markets, if it's done from space with Chinese technique techniques, um, can manipulate every text, every email in ways that we just are not even um, uh, fully aware of as the American public. But those of us in technology understand, and that's why we're so worried about 5G. Had we fast forwarded 10 years and China was successful at dominating global information market, they can tell a lie that will crash American markets and our voice will not be heard internationally. So imagine every country in the world ganging up on America and see how that goes. And so luckily though, they are not fully deployed in their 5G global network and the One Bell, One Road, New Silk Road uh, techniques and the insidious influence in companies around the globe because they buy their seat on the board of directors and so on. Uh, so the truth is coming out and America is able to say that. But this is uh, why it, it's really a, a wasted effort to try to uh, quickly prove things that we may never have the data for. Eventually it may come out whether this was intentionally done, but it really doesn't matter whether it was intentionally done or not. The way China has used this to behave badly and to propagate a lie that it came from the US military is evidence enough of the fact that we have a problem on our hands. And that is we as Western civilization and truth loving people um, have to fight this, or uh, we are on this slippery slope of losing information dominance, 
or at least the ability to tell the truth and let people discover truth for themselves. If we lose that, we'll lose the economy. Thank you, Lieutenant General Cross. Would anyone else on the panel like to answer that? Uh, add any comments? I, Sarah, I'd just like to add that, you know, um, in terms of strategy, um, there is an understanding that China really likes to work towards certainty. Here's a civilization that has literally existed for 5,000 years. Um, they've had some ups and downs, but they have not collapsed. They have the benefit of ancient knowledge. Um, we are a young society um, uh, in many ways, still in its adolescence. And uh, we, we need to respect that. But in terms of the United States, um, I think that uh, there is predictability in us that really causes vulnerability. Um, you know, I, I think that the Constitution is one of those areas where, um, you know, our, our potential peer and near peer competitors understand that this is the bedrock of our civilization. If you undermine this, if you get us at war with each other, if you get, it, get us doubting our federal, state, and, and local governments, and that long-built trust that we have designed and, and earned, right, generation after generation, if you undermine that, you accomplish something very important, and you move people toward fear and away from freedom. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I would add this, that in terms of figuring out uh, how the United States operates, we are an open book. We are an open society. We treasure that, right? We we consider ourselves a light on a hill. Um, I quote, you know, Richard Wormbrand, um, who was a, a, a minister who was tortured for 14 years in a communist prison in Romania. He said at best <clears throat> that America is the last bastion of freedom. Uh, and if we fall to communism, the world falls. The reason he said that is because he knew that we exercise leadership for the world in terms of um, our ideals, um, our grounding, right? The tethering of the law and the constitution. And so if China can get us to begin to contradict ourselves, then they can begin to undermine in a very strong and uh, meaningful way our credibility. And they've been doing it for many years um, in, in other ways, insidiously, both with fake information and real information. And um, it, it, there is an onslaught. But from the, from the Constitution standpoint, um, to circle the conversation back to that, I think that's one of those critical things we need to come and, and, and begin to safeguard. Um, and uh, I had the privilege of being on a, uh, a radio show uh, also uh, in Virginia uh, a couple days ago uh, called Civil Defense Radio. Um, and uh, it's a great program. And, uh, you know, we talked about resilience. And um, uh, the day before yesterday, I saw an article that came out um, in Australia. It was based on a war game. It was a national level war game. And essentially, in a time of denial where um, you know global trade shuts down, Australia has three months to live. I mean, that's it. They can't even produce water after three months. The fuel is gone, the, uh, the chemicals to treat water uh, are gone, the food is gone, and that is not resilience. That is not um, security, right? That is called dependency. And um, I think, uh, you know, to compliment General Quast and the way he framed it, it that um, we have put contracts die into the veins of our nation and better yet, the global economy. And we've said these dependencies are dangerous. We have to begin to wean and have some self-sufficiency. So I think as we kind of swing the pendulum uh, again, as um, uh, Ann said, we, we can't swing it too far, but we've got to come back to the middle where we can say, let's have trade, let's have the benefits of competitive advantage, but let's not go too far. And if you decide to cut me off, uh, I die. And the last thought I'll leave you with is uh, many of you have probably seen the, the movie, The Imitation Game, right? This is a movie about Turing, the guy who uh, invented the turning machine that broke the enigma. Well, before Turing uh, invented that machine, um, there was a, uh, an, another gentleman named Lester Hill, and he came up with a, uh, basically a mathematical formula and um, as part of that formula, there was something called a crib. And um, what they noticed that was with, it, with the Axis powers, every time they transmitted a message, whether it was, hello, how are you, or today's weather, um, there was a common thread in everything that they did. And by using that uh, common piece, you could trace that or like, like Wheel of Fortune, solve the puzzle. 
for the rest of the phrase, right? And you could crack the code um, of the enigma, or you could cut it down in terms of how long it took to crack. And I think um, in terms of us as a transparent society, um, one of the things we want um, our peers and near peers to crack is the fact that we are self-reliant, we are self-sufficient, and that we trust each other and we trust the rule of law, right? Because if you can undermine that, you, you begin to do a lot of damage. And that is really what we have to safeguard as we move into these discussions, as we um, you know, try to talk to those on whatever side of the aisle they're on, keep this in a reason, logical debate and understand that where China is going is to try to solve the puzzle. And if you can solve the puzzle by getting the American people to question the rule of law and their government, you have done enormous destruction to us. So with that, I'll uh, give it back. And uh, did we find out if the Texas Center was on, on the phone still? Thank you, David. No, haven't heard from him. Not sure, but I'd like him to chime in if he could. Um, I know Xiaomin wants to um, make a comment. And after that, a member of the audience has a comment for Dr. Dyer. So Justin, you're up in a minute after Xiaomin. Go ahead, Xiaomin. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of comments. Uh, uh, you know, one point is when, when uh, we say that China has a long history, you know, we have a short history, we have to think about some uh, you know, finer points. China has a long history, but it is a discontinuous, interrupted history of long time. The Communist Party never recognized, recognizes any of the heritage in Chinese history. Take the case of Confucius. In the Confucian, Chinese Communist Party is founded on the platform uh, denouncing Confucius. Well, we know now Confucius is a darling because they, they found it is very appealing to uh, be a propaganda tool. We have Confucius Institute all over in this country. And uh, we have a very long history. Our history is continuous from, I, I would say, from the day of uh, Magna Carta back uh, 800 years ago. We have this constitutional uh, liberty uh, uh, foundation. And uh, we have firms here that were founded even before the United States founded that uninterrupted. So we should be very proud. We have a, a, a continuous uh, liberal capitalism uh, uh, market history. The problem with China is not a long uh, history. It is communism. Here's a, a, a evidence. Look at Taiwan. Taiwan has the same history, same people, same language, heritage. But Taiwan is doing well because it's thriving, because it's a liberal democracy. So that, and uh, in, even in this fight against uh, the, the battle against uh, the virus, the Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, they have done really greatly, but they are not dictatorships. All they have is a kind of a common culture. Well, they, their culture is more uh, obedience to government, to authority, but also they have a collective memory of the horrible scene of uh, uh, infectious disease, SARS. So people are were volunteer, uh, voluntarily taking a lot of precaution even before the government, that's the difference. So that's why culture is a vital element of governance. Uh, I want to make uh, another point, uh, you know, uh, as we know, science uh, published a article saying that had China give us an early warning, 95% of the cases uh, would have been avoided in the world. So that is what we all know. So, and, and the, I really support that the whole world should seek the truth, see, to, to investigate to the origin and, the, and the, this, this accident or this uh, breakup, what, what happened in that uh, uh, P4 uh, lab in Wuhan. Uh, that, that's another point. Um, in the, the Chinese strategy, uh, you know, people ask why you know, chi China gives tons of money to Africa, gives tons of money here and there, uh, the, 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 the Belt and Road Initiative and here. Why? Uh, because uh, a couple of reasons, uh, wants to be uh, dominant, that's one reason. But there's a, actually a reason that is their domestic reason. As I said, uh, there's a rising middle class, but the middle class is quiet because if you criticize the, the party, uh, you, you know, you, you'll be in jail. But privately, people are questioning, ridiculing, or criticizing the party. And the party does not like it. How, how could they do it? Because China needs globalization. So they have to have people coming out. 
Okay, given the uh, circumstances, I'm going to go ahead and mute the call if everybody can dial back in. Welcome back on Zoom. We had to leave GoToMeeting due to an unfortunate caller who was trying to hack our very, very profound and wise discourse and debate. And Justin was about to give his comments to a caller's question. Justin, if you could rephrase the question and then continue with your answer. Sure. The question was about whether states would be able to protect liberty in the days ahead. And I was reflecting on the theme of the panel, which was protecting the American Constitution or preserving the American Constitution and thinking about what a constitution is exactly. And constitutions are instruments that divide political power and authorize different bodies to make policy for us. They sometimes limit that power through the articulation of rights and they create political institutions for us to govern through those constitutions. And our discussion had focused on foreign policy and national security, and I was trying to think a little bit about where that might fit in with the Constitution, and the reflection was that the U.S. Constitution was really designed for those two purposes. If you think about the reasons why we created a national constitution as opposed to just having 13 different state constitutions. The primary purpose of the national constitution was for national security and for the regulation of the economy, more specifically commerce between the states, among the several states and foreign nations. And the question seems to be one that's a national policy question if we're talking about industrial policy, and national security and some of those kinds of issues. But the regulation of citizens' day-to-day -day lives still really is primarily a state-level function and certainly was primarily a state-level function when the Constitution was written. And so the states had a general police power and what we end up calling a general police power. And the phrase that was often used until recently was that states could legislate for the health, safety, and morals of the community. And that power included things like Dave Rowland talked about earlier, which was the power of quarantine and the power of cordon, that there were limitations on individuals' liberties in times of epidemics or pandemics. And state governments were primarily tasked with carrying that out. That's been the case in our current moment. And so if you think about the stay-at-home orders that have been promulgated in the United States, they've been done at the state and local level. And so in my city, for example, the stay-at-home order comes from the director of public health in the city itself through a, an order and then is limited through state statute and through the state constitution in terms of the penalties that can come from that. The city only has the authority to uh, create misdemeanors. And so there's a limit to what the authority, to what the penalty might be for a violation of a misdemeanor at the city level. The state, however, has much broader authority than that. And the state has the authority through the consent of the citizens of that state exercised through its constitution and different states divide this in different ways. They have different mechanisms to trigger emergency powers for governors. Sometimes the legislature is more involved. Sometimes it's an executive decision, but that's a, it's a constitutional issue that's decided at the state level. And so then getting back to this question, can states preserve liberty in the days ahead? I think it's our best hope to preserve liberty. And the reason I say that is a variation of a, something that uh, Dean Dorman said earlier, but it's that uh, at the national level, policy for one state might make sense, and it might not make sense for another state. And of course, within the states themselves, policies for one county or one city might make more sense than it does for another county or another city. And so it is this perfect area in which the devolution of political authority makes the most sense and I think works the best because you have very specific things on the ground that need to be addressed. Now, with respect to the national constitution, there has been over time the development of doctrines, judicial doctrines at the national level that hold that the rights that are protected in the U.S. constitution limit not only the national government, but also limit the state governments. And through that, the courts have created uh, these tiers of scrutiny, and the lawyers in the audience will understand all of this or be familiar with it, but it's an important point, I think, for citizens to think of as well. When they talk about tiers of scrutiny, what they say at a really 40,000-foot level is that if the government is going to restrict a fundamental constitutional right, and this would be state governments or national government, through their policy, they have to have a compelling reason to do so. And not only should they have a compelling reason to do so, but they should have a policy that pursues that compelling interest 
in a really narrowly tailored way that's the least restrictive of the right in question. So it's not to say that state governments can never restrict rights to try to combat a pandemic or try to prevent the communication of disease, but it is to say that when they do so in a way that restricts fundamental rights, it should be a narrowly tailored policy and it should be the least restrictive of the right in question in order to carry out the public purpose of the public function. That's, as I said, it's a judicially created doctrine. It's the way that the courts have addressed these issues over time. But there's a lot of wisdom in that. And I think a lot of uh, benefit that comes from going through that analysis as we think about these different policies that have happened at the state level. We can ask, what's the government's interest here? Is it compelling? I think in, in a time of a pandemic, it might be very compelling in some circumstances to limit liberty temporarily in order to try to preserve public health. But then we have to take another step and ask, is it actually being pursued in a narrowly tailored way that's the least restrictive of the rights in question? And on that, I think many of the state policies fall short and, and I hope would fall short through the litigation process. So just to take one example, there was a case that came out of Riverside County in California where the Riverside County stay at home order very specifically said that there would be no public or private gatherings and then listed church among the public and private gatherings that would be banned and then exempted all sorts of public and private gatherings from that order, but specifically did not exempt churches. And so what you had was this situation where you could go to a liquor store, you could go to a marijuana dispensary, you could go to Walmart, but you couldn't go to church. And it was very specifically forbidden from citizens from doing that. And in one instance, one of the plaintiffs who brought a, a case against the order wanted to have a drive-in church service where parishioners were in their cars wearing masks parked six feet apart in the parking lot and were forbidden from doing that by the county order. And so if you took this to a court, and they did take it to court, but if courts looked at this and they asked, does the county have a compelling interest in preventing these gatherings? Are they pursuing that interest with a narrow tailored policy that's the least restrictive of the rights in question. I think if you went through those steps and asked that question, you have to say, no, they're not. And then as further evidence of that, they're specifically exempting all sorts of gatherings and then targeting religious gatherings um, for, for enforcement uh, with the order. If we did that across the country in all these various localities and looked at these orders one by one, I think some of them would certainly stand but a lot of them I think would fall. And so we'll start to see how that plays out. I don't think courts are the only avenue here and I don't think they should be our primary hope in terms of preserving liberty. This is a conversation for citizens as a whole. It's a conversation for legislators. It's a conversation for executives who are issuing the orders in the first place. And so it's we the people together through our representatives and through our institutions that have to make these decisions. But I think that's going to be, at least for the time, primarily a local level conversation. Now, at the national level, of course, the president does have the bully pulpit. You have nightly press briefings, you have recommendations coming from the CDC. And so you do have a powerful way in which the conversation is shaped nationally. And of course, with national news and a 24-hour news cycle, everybody's hearing about things going on everywhere. It's not localized like it was in the 1918 flu pandemic. On the other hand, the national government has authority to regulate commerce among the several states in commerce with foreign nations. Some of that authority gets delegated to the CDC, and so the CDC does have authority to prevent um, travel across state lines from people who are diagnosed positive with a disease. The national government does have the authority through its regulation of immigration to have travel bans from certain areas or to prevent people from coming into the country or to have screenings. There's a role there. But for most of us, if you're going to work, if you're opening a restaurant, if you're going to the gym, if you want to go to your house of worship, if you're going to have a funeral service, all of those kinds of things are really not going to be subject to national regulation and are going to be done at the local level and, and I think in conversation with citizens at the local level and in an area where you can have the most impact, I think, as a citizen and actually having your voice heard. So that's a maybe a, a positive way to think about our structure of power under the Constitution and how we can think through this policy together as a people. Really good comments, Justin. Um, Senator Hughes, you're on the phone and I'm sure you heard that. We haven't heard from you all morning and I guess now's your chance to speak since we're back in this forum. I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much. And I'm certainly 
hope you enjoyed the discussion and listening in. And um, something that uh, Representative Dorman mentioned initially was the role the federal government has chosen to take during the pandemic, and he had a positive remark about it. And I have to follow along with that. Uh, President Trump is characterized in the media as a strong man, and, and many times his style and, and his uh, vernacular but lends itself to that. But we have to say note that uh, compared to previous uh, recent administrations, we talked a lot uh, this morning about uh, the Patriot Act and all the increased federal powers. Um, that uh, came on after September 11th, even the 2008 financial collapse and all the regulatory powers that the feds took on after that. And um, but there was a great uh, article, I guess an opinion piece, a couple of weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal about that, about how different the federal response has been this time. But remarkably, they've used that for deregulation. We recognize that when the feds exercise power, just because we like it, that doesn't make it okay, right? We have to make sure it's done properly in the context of, within the limits of the Constitution, as it's been discussed. But overall, it's been encouraging now, uh, in spite of comments, maybe one of comments, the White House is telling us this, the states, uh, and that has not been a normal response uh, historically. And as you're also seeing in the media, and also in a lot of polling, the White House has been criticized for not having a stronger, based, uniform um, response. But I am very thankful, very thankful that the federal government is respecting federalism. Uh, that's been come up so many times in the discussion, even just now. I'm thankful for what you said. And, and uh, uh, of course, uh, we recognize we're concerned about the power of the government generally. But if we're talking about state versus federal, I'm very thankful that the feds have taken the approach they've taken thus far. There are some scary examples of state and local authorities going too far. Uh, we, we're blessed in Texas to have a governor who recognizes the proper role and is you know, wisely and we believe prayerfully making these decisions. But even here we've had some conflict between local county uh, and local officials and the governor. And so far we think the governor staff together does properly but but um there's always, of course, uh, the ability to vote with one seat. Right? Not immediately available to us maybe during the pandemic, but I think the, the responses of different state governments and even different local governments during this, uh, one of the lessons we're going to learn, and I think one of the things we're going to see is uh, people are going to either see changes in those governments or they're going to go somewhere else. And, uh, we've seen that in general. I don't want to editorialize too much, but we've seen the general move uh, of population heavy-handed regulation and heavy tax burdens in states uh, with more opportunity and more liberal in this place. Senator Hughes, thank you for that. Um, your your rec your reception is a little um, garbled. We're we're having a hard time hearing you, but we got the gist of what you said. And while you were talking, uh, there was a question from Dave um, with regards to police power and the prospect for litigation, and the kinds of popular responses most likely to address problems of governmental overreach. Would anyone on the panel like to address that? So I was hoping to jump in and follow up what um, Professor Dyer was saying 
um, he, he did a good job of kind of laying out the role of constitutions, both at the federal and state level, um, and talking about the levels of scrutiny that courts tend to apply. Um, although, you know, unfortunately, a lot of what he said functions more at the, at the theoretical level than it does in an actual courtroom. And so I wanted to address a little bit why we have part of the problem that we have with our courts and then what can be done about it. Um, so, so Justin talked about the police power, um, the authority that the government has to act when it's perceived to be necessary to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. Um, the challenge that we have is all of our understandings of the police power come from the common law. Um, I'm not aware of any state constitution that actually defines the police power. So because this was never reduced to text, it was never given solid boundaries or definitions in constitutional texts, courts have taken that as a justification to interpret it as widely as they want. Um, there are a number of cases talking about the police power dating back into the early 20th century where they specifically say the, the police power is broad and undefined Therefore, we get to interpret this however we want to. And it has been interpreted in recent years, even to include uh, regulating aesthetics, how things look. Um, so in other words, a number of courts, and th this is not isolated, this is pervasive throughout the country uh, in, in our judicial systems, they would hold that you can restrict even fundamental constitutional rights um, if the government has so much as an interest in regulating what something looks like. So uh, I've, been, I've been pressing in, in, here in Missouri uh, in both in litigation and uh, at, a, uh, at a legislative level to try and more clearly define what the police power is and what its limits are. Uh, because right now, courts barely acknowledge those limits at all. If, if I can give just a brief anecdote to illustrate the problem, we had a case uh, that we litigated for five years where uh, a suburb told its residents that they had to devote at least half of their yard space to growing turf grass. So um, we had a client who uh, is a two-time cancer survivor. She had uh, a severe grass allergy. And so she uprooted all the grass in her yard and made her entire yard a beautiful, well-maintained flower garden. Um, the city argued that even though property rights are a fundamental right, the city's interest in regulating aesthetics was still sufficient to justify commanding people that they had to plant and maintain a plant that made them sick. And the courts let them do that. Uh, they ended up dodging our, our primary constitutional claims, but the bottom line is the courts had zero inclination to rein in what they saw as the government's police power. Um, so I think in order to, to turn this around, um, well, first, as Justin noted, when you're dealing with an epidemic, um, courts will bend over backwards to try and uphold um, exercises of governmental power. The limits come in where there's some sort of discrimination involved. So I mentioned uh, back in the, the first element of this conversation, um, that case from San Francisco, where they had tried to cordon off Chinatown. The problem, according to the courts there, was not that they were trying to cordon off part of the city. It was that the restriction was being unequally applied. Uh, and that's where the courts were willing to step in. And we've seen that regularly where, where courts have rejected certain exercises of governmental power in the context of an epidemic. Um, they've tended to focus on unequal application of the laws. Um, so that provides at least some hope that, that courts will push back. Um, we talked about the issue of churches uh, not being allowed to have meetings, even though other types of similar businesses, uh, you know, businesses, 
uh, organizations were allowed to have gatherings as long as they abided by certain restrictions. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of success in litigation uh, saying, yes, if you're going to let people go to drive through liquor stores, then yes, you have to let people go to drive through church services. Um, so I, I do see a lot of promise there. But my broader point, and, and this is what I hope that some of the thought leaders that we have assembled here will focus on, is we need some base level institutional change in order to ensure that going forward, we do not see these kinds of governmental abuses happen again. Um, we have the opportunity in the wake of all this to go back to either through ordinary legislation, um, which you know would happen in state houses and city halls all over the country, or through constitutional reform uh, to clarify, number one, the police power itself has to be limited. And here's, here are the four corners of what the police power should be understood to be. Um, and then I think we should even address emergency situations. Uh, a lot of states have emergency provisions for good reason, but they're very open-ended. So for example, in Missouri, uh, once the governor declares an emergency, it's perpetual until either the governor acts to rescind the order or until the legislature votes to end the emergency. Um, I actually, I, I think that the wiser way to go about this would say, okay, you can declare an emergency, but it automatically expires at the end of a set date and some additional action has to be taken to renew the emergency if circumstances warrant. Um, one way that Missouri is kind of ahead of the curve of a lot of these states is Missouri statute that authorizes the declaration of an emergency specifies that the governor can only invoke it when there is an emergency actually underway. In other words, you can't declare an anticipatory emergency. We think that something is going to happen. We hypothesize that something's going to cause an emergency. Missouri law doesn't let you do that, but other states do let you do that. Uh, they don't put boundaries on the circumstances under which an emergency can be declared. Um, so we need to be, I think, focusing right now on learning how our states are currently um, enabling these sorts of emergencies to be declared, the powers that they authorize, and then learning from other states to figure out how can we do this better going forward. We've, we've hit this, this crisis point. Uh, we're learning a lot from it. Now we need to put those lessons into action. We need to make sure that these kinds of abuses, uh, at least to the extent possible, are prevented from happening again. One final point I want to toss in there. Um, all of this comes down to ultimately, will the courts be willing to use their authority to rein in governmental power? Uh, because one of the things that the last 250 years have taught us is that government will always push the envelope. Like it, it is the nature of government to try and accumulate more and more power to those who hold um, the, the seats of authority. Uh, and this of course is, is what James Madison and, and the other authors of the Federalists recognized um, is that we have to have constitutional restraints because otherwise the government will always seek to increase its power. Um, the judiciary is supposed to be the branch that provides the check on the excesses of the legislature and the executive when they get outside of their proper constitutional bounds. And as of right now, it's really extraordinarily and frustratingly rare that the government will do that. And it's because the, the courts, the judges are now concerned about um, judicial activism. They're concerned that if they invalidate an act of the legislature, if they invalidate an executive act, that they will be seen and portrayed as judicial activists. The problem is, is this has led to an abdication of their actual constitutional duties. Um, if the courts are not towing the line, if the courts are not uh, reining in these abuses of governmental power when they happen, then our constitutions really aren't worth much. 
Um, so one of the things I've proposed, particularly in Missouri, uh, and again, to, to descend a little bit into an anecdote, um, in 2014, Missouri voters, by a, a pretty significant margin, adopted a constitutional provision that was supposed to give us the strongest protections in the entire country for the right of self-defense, the right to keep and bear arms. Within two years, the Missouri Supreme Court totally gutted it, um, despite the strongest possible language we can come up with, and I helped draft the provision, um, the Missouri Supreme Court basically said, look, as long as some restriction on firearms uh, is believed by the courts to be uh, supported by a strong history, a substantial consensus, and simple common sense, then the courts are going to rubber stamp it. Um, and and to follow up what the Missouri Supreme Court did just in the last year, a judge in Boone County upheld a total gun ban on the campus of the University of Missouri, saying, oh, well, this is supported by a long history, a substantial consensus, and common sense. Well, by that rationale, you would have to uphold a gun ban across the entire state of Missouri, in spite of a extremely popular, very recent contra, uh, constitutional provision to be otherwise. So. To sum up, we need strong textual protections, both in statutes and in constitutions, but even more so, we need judges and courts that uh, have the fortitude to stand up and enforce those protections. Uh, and then barring that, widespread civil disobedience is, is the only result. And we're seeing that a little bit now. I mean, uh, yesterday in California, um, huge crowds out protesting the, the order to close beaches. Um, so it may be that, that we finally have reached a point where um, citizens are, are going to simply just start disobeying uh, these kinds of, of laws and orders on a massive scale. Um, and that may be the tipping point that we actually need to see some effective change take place. But I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll close with that. Outstanding, Dave. Really good comments. And while you were um, speaking, um, Brian Hughes was able to join the Zoom. So if you could say something, Brian, so we can know you're there. And then we have a question from the uh, audience here. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Still enjoying the discussion and uh, looking forward to uh, participating as we go on. Okay, so we have a question for this panel and you can take this maybe, Brian. It's from Ohio and he, he asks, we continue to centralize a lot of critical aspects of our society. What are the panel's thoughts on decentralization and the dangers of the Chinese wall security model? Well, we recognize everyone on this call and I'm sure the folks uh, who will be listening and, and looking later understand how loath our founders were to centralize power, right? Uh, and so we get that, and we've talked about federalism and how important it is that local decisions be made as locally as possible. Uh, for one thing, local folks know the situation on the ground, and also if they mess up and put in bad policy, the damage is limited to that locality. The whole state, the whole nation doesn't suffer from bad decisions uh, by government officials. So I guess that's been a theme of our discussion, but at a time like this, uh, we're under no greater peril than than, uh, than we are now, right? We're in the, uh, oh, it's the, no one, I guess none of us have, have quoted the, the venerable Franklin yet about liberty versus security, right? But folks are willing to give it up. And you've seen the polling, right? Let me just say this on that point. You've, you've probably all seen the polling. We do see more protests and business people are ready to open up. And many people, uh, numbers are growing on folks that want to open back up. But you've seen where still, in most places, the majority of Americans, uh, for fear, uh, fear is not the word, but out of security, out of concern for their families, for their health, their family's health, they're fine with keeping things locked down longer. Now, that the longer this goes, the, the, the more of us are in favor of opening up. But maybe this demonstrates to us how quickly we will give up uh, that liberty uh, for the promise of temporary security. And uh, it's a continuing challenge. And uh, I guess since I guess this is the first time since World War II that in America we've even considered limitations on personal liberty, on speech, on travel, uh, on commerce, like we have during this time. Based on the information we had at the beginning, 
it made sense to a lot of people. It makes sense to a lot less people as we learn more and more uh, about the virus. So it's legitimate concern. I don't have an easy answer, but let's err on the side of decentralized power. And I would just say with deepest respect to my fellow member of the bar, Dave, about the, the court's reluctance to exercise that power. Let me just say this. And again, I've spent a little time in federal court. I clerk for a federal judge and certainly respect what you do. And I'm a fan. But I'll say this. In modern American history, the greatest threat has not been courts refusing to overturn a legislative uh, uh, passage, past measures, or the courts refusing to overturn the will of the voters. We've had the opposite problem. So it's got to be a balance. You're correct. We don't want to be in one ditch or the other. But I'd rather have a judiciary too weak than a judiciary too strong. And I'll, I'll yield on that. Thank you so much, Brian. Preston, did you want to uh, ask something? Thank you. And uh, Lieutenant General Quas, yeah. I think you had a question, comments? Yeah, so I, I, um, I really appreciate these comments, but this is to Dave and I'd like people's reaction to it. Um, our founding fathers talked about this very dilemma and uh, there is a reason the constitution is silent on um, the limits of power with regard to the common security. And that's because ultimately you have to survive or all the laws in the world, all the rule of the law in the world doesn't matter. I think his signal froze up. Okay, I'm back up. Do, can you hear me again? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I heard you say that uh, we have to have uh, security or else liberty doesn't matter. I, I think that was what you were saying, yeah. but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. So if you can hear me now, can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so yeah, what I was saying is that uh, uh, so the Federalist Papers uh, go around and around on this very conversation you're talking about, or what are the limits uh, of the power of let's, the police, for example? And they were silent intentionally because dem dem democracy can be a tyranny as fast as a, as a dictatorship. Uh, and there's always a balance. And it goes back to what the senator was saying. Where would you rather have uh, the, the, the damage? On, on the judicial side or you know, too strong or too weak. And so they were silent intentionally on that point because ultimately this comes down to values. And if you have a judge that has certain values that interprets the constitution, whether it's state or federal, consistent with a bias towards one value or another, it can go haywire as we've seen in so many examples. Um, and and the, the founding fathers were anticipating unexpected events in the future that they could never anticipate, whether it's technological changes, cultural changes, and they would have never anticipated a world as interconnected as we have today and the speed of the spread. But they knew there would be threats to the survival of the state or the survival of the nation that could, be, could not be anticipated. And therefore, you have to preserve the, enough power to achieve the boundary condition, and that is survival. Uh, and then everything else can be negotiated. And this is why they're silent on the boundaries. So I agree, the, the one co example you gave of a boundary you would give would be time limit, meaning once the crisis is over, you can't have that. That's, that one's okay, I could live with that one. But if you start putting boundaries, you may put a boundary that kills you because you cannot foresee or anticipate the kind of threats that will happen 300 years from now. And this is why they were silent on that point. And it's a very important, uh, the, the wisdom of our founding fathers anticipated that we would have an event like this and they intentionally were silent so we could take collective action to keep us safe. Now, like the Senator said, early on the data, most Americans were willing to take on this individual limitation, even though we knew it was not constitutional. But now that the data is showing something different, we wanna throw off the shackles of that oppressive policy because it's not constitutional and hopefully the courts will hold that up. Thank you so much. Uh, Dean, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, thank you, Sarah. I, I think this is exactly, uh, you know, what makes us the uh, free society is, is being able to exchange these ideas and it's having people involved. And I think that's where we, uh, we've got to keep the emphasis on the local level. Obviously, uh, we have national um, concerns and issues, but uh, by by people becoming involved and expressing their concerns and keeping an eye on the local level, um, that's a, a healthy way uh, to keep our, our freedoms and liberties alive because that's the whole point of federalism um, is to keep it 
you know, to the the lo most local level possible. But people have got to be engaged, and oftentimes we go on about our jobs and our work and our you know our families and all these things are very time consuming, and it's only in these times of crisis that we uh, that we kind of look and say, hey. Well, what's going on? And the public health boards are a perfect example. Uh, uh, the Missouri legislature made a, a bad move, and I told them that several years ago, to take people off the ballot if they are running for a, a position that is non-paid and there's no opposition. Well, the result has become people don't know that these boards even exist. And then uh, they've kind of assumed some powers uh, that they don't necessarily have. And we've gone through this with um, confined animal feeding operations, CAFOs in the past, and we're gonna go through it again here real quickly, is um, people don't know who they are. Uh, they're handing out rules. Um, are these people elected? They don't know if they're elected. Um, what, what's the problem? Well, that's we've gotta bring this process out to the public. Uh, we've gotta get it into the local media. We gotta at least have it available for people to understand. And I guess this is a little bit uh, uh, timely, but you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant here, and, and it's the best disinfectant for freedom. We've got to uh, we've got to be able to keep these lines open, and that's why we have all this um, separation of powers and and uh, checks and balances. And don't forget, the states are a very important part of that whole system. And um, as Madison said, it slides back and forth. As the general is saying, we've got issues that at times only um, only Washington and the federal government, and sometimes even only the president can address if we went into an immediate attack. I can't imagine the information Trump was being given, you know, sort of through a, a fire hose and he had to make a decision. But uh, again, I'll say, um, I don't think he overreacted on that. I think he did the best he could with what he had at the time. And we're seeing what's what's happening. We're getting better information now and hopefully we'll get a better model. And I saw I saw one question, if I might, and then I'll get off. Um, uh, you know, has this pandemic conditioned us to comply and be managed? And that goes back to my list of questions I had before. You know, we've really got to scrutinize this model and, and why it was so widely accepted and why it came down as it did to tell us that, uh, you know, the death rate was going to be higher. Uh, I do think it's quite an infectious disease uh, that went, but, um, you know, what, you know, why was it so readily accepted? Um, next time it might not go um, the way it's gone this time. Uh, I think we're going to begin backing off now and by June for certain. We'll probably be back up to uh, what we, we know as normal, but um, might not go that way next time. So I agree. We, we've got a lot of questions to answer, and I, I highly encourage everyone to be involved in that discussion. Great. And Representative Dorman, I'll just uh, follow up to what you mentioned real quick. Um, and and the, again, to restate the question, uh, Will the COVID-19 pandemic condition the American people to comply and be managed? In other words, are we dumbing down? Um, I, I don't think so. And I think, um, as uh, Dave mentioned earlier, the uh, the protests, the uh, you know, kind of civil disobedience, if you will, within the uh, realm of constitutionally allowed activities, um, has begun to uh, rise. And I think we can uh, be proud that you know the American people have a, a fairly good sense of uh, what is reasonable. And um, I do think that, uh, as you said, we need to scrutinize, um, but, and, and even to further on, <coughs> uh, to go further on that point, um, you know, activities such as this, um, there was rampant speculation early on as to whether or not this was a, uh, a planned activity uh, in the strategic sense, in the national security sense, if this was uh, deliberate. And um, because there was such low fidelity, um, because of the misinformation and, and the information war uh, in which we uh, seem to find ourselves this day and age, um, it was very hard to get to ground truth. And um, so uh, we have to, um, you, you know, muddle through, if you will, very quickly and get back to normal, um, if you will, rise above it when we have these, uh, these kinds of events uh, happen. And I think uh, what really, one of the things that concerned me was the censorship of the uh, two doctors in California that began to question a lot of the, uh, the data 
that had come out from the CDC and they said, okay, all right. Initially the response looked reasonable, but after the testing, um, you know, samples that we had, that allowed us to extrapolate, um, you know, information and data over the wider population at, at a very, very high fidelity. And yet we maintain these restrictions. And so when they uh, began to question the narrative, um, they began to be uh, uh, intensely scrutinized by not only members of the media, but um, uh, certainly uh, their community leadership. And so, um, you know, for us, the American people, the charge uh, rests on us. It, the, uh, you know, uh, the understanding of what should and should not be allowed by our government is, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it's very much uh, spelled out. Uh, within reason, within the U.S. Constitution. And if that document is to be amended, there are ways to amend it. But certainly in the gray areas that are not well-defined, we need to move through those periods of ambiguity very quickly and um, get to certainty. And where, uh, you know, a justification cannot be made, you have to, again, pull the mad dog of tyranny back on the leash and push that stake back into the ground because the only thing that separates us is our constitutional freedoms. And um, it's really important that we safeguard those, that we educate our children about them, that we have these conversations and, with our neighbors in the barbershop, and, uh, and that we keep this debate fresh and in all of our minds. Because again, uh, in the future, there may be scares, right? Like the Red Scare um, back during the Cold War and, and other opportunities where um, an adversary may try to deliberately uh, exploit these kinds of opportunities. And we have to guard you and I against those kinds of opportunities. Okay. I think we had a question here and uh, Dave, uh, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I just posted something on, on Facebook a, a couple of days ago about this. And um, I think my perspective on what the pandemic looks like going forward may be significantly different from uh, from what I've been hearing from from a couple of you guys. Uh, so just for context, I've, I've been watching this since early January. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't rely on major news outlets. I, I was just looking at the data as it was coming in uh, from Asia first and then from Europe. And um, I think it's very important, particularly for those of us who are advocating liberty, um, that we not understate the risks that we're facing here. Because I do think that we are still facing very significant risks. We're not, it's not one of those situations where, oh my goodness, everyone's going to die. That's, that's not the case. Even in an absolute worst case scenario with, with this virus, it only kills maximum, you know, 1% to 1.5% of people who get it. Um, so that means you've got a 98.5% survival rate, even in a worst case scenario. So I don't think anyone needs to be running around with their hair on fire. I do think we need to be serious about what it means if uh, you've got, say, a half percent of your entire population ultimately dying. Because I think that that is not, an, it's not out of the question that that's what we're actually looking at. Um, the, for starters, uh, even though we are kind of over the peak in some areas of the United States, as things start to open up, the virus is not going anywhere. It's going to start spreading again. And, and I think that we all need to be prepared to see that happen. And I don't think it's going to wait until the fall either. I think it's going to be in a matter of a month to six weeks after we start opening things up. We're going to start seeing the numbers go up again, uh, which is part of the reason why I think we need to make these principled calls to protect liberty now, um, because this this is coming around again real quick. Um, but uh, I put a link to to the Facebook post so you can see kind of the just the raw numbers uh, of what has been happening, and and I pointed out there are a lot of people who who speculate about maybe maybe the numbers are getting inflated. If you look at the numbers from the worst hit areas in Europe, particularly Bergamo, Italy, um, Madrid, Spain, and then the Brussels region in Belgium, um, it's pretty consistent uh, what they're ultimately seeing. And, and 
you compare that to what's happening in, in the US, and again, it's, it's really consistent. Um, and so I, I think that we, we really have to be clear eyed about the fact that this actually is going to kill a lot of people. Um, I mean, I, I am not an expert, um, but the experts that I follow think that ultimately 60 to 70% of the, of our entire population is going to be infected. Um, and there's disagreement about what the ultimate mortality rate will be. But I think the conservative estimate is about 0.5%. And 0.5% of 200 plus million is a lot of people. Um, so, so I think in order for us as thought leaders to maintain our credibility, um, we cannot downplay uh, the risks of the virus. Because if, if we make a statement publicly saying, oh, well, now it's going away and everything's going to be fine, and then six weeks from now, it is not fine, that calls into question the credibility of what we've had to say prior. Um, you know, or they could say, well, you advocated for liberty because you thought this was going away. Now that it's not doing that, we can throw out your, your perspective. What I've tried to do is say, even in light of the fact that I think that this is still going to get really bad, in a lot of ways, not as bad as it could, but, but pretty bad, um, I still think that liberty is the solution. I, I think it's a necessary solution. I think the alternative is far worse than, um, than, than um, yeah, I, I just, I, I want to make sure that as we're going out and, and speaking about these issues, um, that, that we think through the possibility that, that the pandemic is not actually over and it's not going away. So that's. Yeah, Dave, uh, this, is, this is Steve. One, one thing to think about is who is calculating the risk on the other side? Uh, yeah. For example, if you take driving your car, uh, take a look at how many um, thousands of people die every year driving your car, yet we still go out and drive our car because we, we make that choice as individuals. And, um, and it, it, it had fat packs others too. If I go out and drive and I'm not paying attention and I'm texting and I kill somebody else, it's not just my life I'm putting at risk, it's others. Um, so who is measuring the risk to our economy, to the, uh, the, the intellectual health, uh, the suicide rate, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, with regard to this as well, because data can lie. And uh, we know the data is always wrong initially, and it takes time to understand the data. And this is why I agree with the, the freedom and liberty piece, but let local people make their decisions because they know their environment better and uh, allowing this nuance that it's not a state policy, it should be down to the county level and, and below. And I think with the information systems we have today, we can do that and let rely on what the founding fathers knew was going to be the great wisdom of the ages, and that is the individual citizens of this country. Um, and to bias your your risk aversion calculus to, well, I'm seeing this initial data, therefore we have to do this, and not calculating what that's going to mean to the economy, to the to the emotional health and the other death that will happen if the economy is not healthy, because a bad economy kills a hell of a lot more people over history um, than any pandemic uh, has ever killed. Yeah, that, that's a point uh, that I made in my Facebook post. Yeah. Yeah, good. So it, it's very careful to have a holistic conversation about this and uh, let local people make local decisions based on their prudent common sense. And uh, the, the liberty and freedom has to be there, but uh, don't let the government make your decision for you locally like we're seeing right now. Agreed. Really good comments, thank you all. Um, David, did you uh, want to make some final closing remarks as we're running out of time? No, I just want to uh, thank you, Sarah and uh, Preston, for uh, hosting and moderating. Uh, tremendous panel, tremendous uh, deep insights, and uh, uh, some great uh, discussion, great debate at times. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the ball is in our court as the American people. Um, it is our job to hold accountable um, all aspects of our elected leadership, uh, our law, um, and, uh, and those who are uh, implementing those on our behalf. So uh, on behalf of the American Leadership and Policy Foundation, I just want to thank those who have joined, uh, been willing to contribute their time, your uh, willingness to listen to this conversation. 
uh, proves uh, that you are watering the tree of liberty rather than standing by and watching it wither. Um, every generation uh, has its own call to arms, the need to fight and hold back uh, the tyranny that knocks on the door of every civilization. And, uh, you know, this is part of the challenge of our age. And uh, not only is the threat sometimes within, it is often external as we've discussed. So thank you all for your very reasoned, reasonable debate um, and contributions. Uh, on behalf of the American Leadership and Policy Foundation, uh, I'd like to thank the um, Civil Defense Radio for hosting uh, this discussion as well. We look forward to uh, partnering with you in the future. And uh, the American Leadership and Policy Foundation is a, uh, a committed organization to bring research and discussion for the people by the people with no strings attached. Um, we are 501c3 who does not take federal special interest or government, uh, government money, money from uh, businesses. Uh, we are funded by you so that we can represent you. And so um, if you have an interest in learning more about us, go to alpf.org and um, uh, check us out there. And uh, also please like us on Facebook and on um, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and uh, keep the debate going, keep it alive and keep the fire in the belly. Thank you all. And that is the end of Civil Defense Radio Presents number one with the American Leadership and Policy Foundation. Civil defense equals resiliency equals survival. The top-down governmental approach to solve our community resiliency problem has failed us. We need a community-based, grassroots approach to solve this problem. To be resilient, it takes preparation, organization, and training to meet the needs of whatever situation we may find ourselves in. Civil defense helps reduce panic in a disaster, and this is why we strongly recommend establishing a community-based civil defense organization in your city or county in partnership with your local emergency manager and community leaders. Let's start a conversation with the guide found on our resources page at civildefenseradio.com. And be sure to check out our regular postings on Facebook at Civil Defense Radio and on Twitter at civil underscore def, D-E-F underscore radio, and also on YouTube under Civil Defense Radio Podcast. I wish to thank our guests at the American Leadership and Policy Foundation and uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to bring this to you, the American public. And it's a discussion that is very, very needed at this time. So I wish to thank you, our friends and listeners out there also. We really appreciate you being with us this week. So please, be safe, be informed, be prepared, and God bless you.